Today we will be discussing um, ideas connected to the novel The Help, written by Catherine Stockett. Um, a limited number of free books will be available to students with valid student IDs after the presentation. So if that's of interest to you, go ahead and head out to our desk and you can pick one of those up. Um, during the month of March, we encourage you to read the book The Help along with us. And at the end of the month of March, we will have a film show of the help in the student lounge one month from today on uh, March 20th, from noon until 2. So read the book with us this month. At the end of the month, we will watch how that book was moved into film for the Black Music film version of the book. Um, I want to take a moment to say thank you to the Luke Library for all the help that they have provided in um, making so many of the Women's History Month events possible. Without them, so so much to the library and its staff for making this possible. Um, also, if you've not already done so, I highly suggest that you take a look at the quilts that are out um, in the center areas of the library. There are paper quilts that run along the computers out here, and then there's the cloth quilts over in the foyer area, and they are just remarkable. We had a number of women from the community. Um, and a couple of LGBT instructors who quilted, uh, who quilted and gave us the ability to display their quilts for the month and included their stories of how they came about um, with quilting and what quilting means to them. Really so if you have a chance sometime this month, they'll be up all month, to uh, take some time and wander around and look at those. Um, all right, so please welcome Raj Slisby, LCCC Instructor of Mass Media and Broadcast Journalism. To kick off our reading of the Help and Women's History Month, Raj will be speaking today on her experiences growing up in the South with the maid. Thank you so much. Please welcome Raj. Thanks, Kat. Um, first of all, I need to tell you that I have not read the book, but I have read, or I have seen the movie. And when I saw the movie in the movie theater, I walked out and I said, this is my life. I, and, I, and I just couldn't believe how accurate it was. So when um, uh, Nick asked, uh, Nick was telling our division meeting in January uh, when we came back to school, she told, she told us what, what she was planning for Women's History Month. And afterwards I said to her as we were leaving, I said, you know, I, I grew up in the South with the maid, and everybody around us, it was like, I had thrown the horn. You know what I mean? It's like, really? Really? Exactly. And um, I said, so I'd be, be glad, you know, to talk about this if you want. And um, I, I, I went back and got look, looked at the movie again. And this time what I did is I took notes, okay, throughout the whole movie. And I did a couple of things. Um, one thing, I wanted to look at how the set was and, and did they get that right growing up in the 50s and 60s. And then the other thing was to try to tie some things together. And that's what I'm going to try to do today. Now, can I have a show of hands? How many have read the book? Okay, about him. How many have seen the movie? Okay, so uh, I'm not, I, you know, the storyline is, I, I'm not going to focus on that, Nick, because I'm, I'm going to focus on institutions and place and things like that so that you can get a feel for that. Um, and what I'm hoping is that when you actually do see the movie or you look at the movie again, you will see certain things and maybe that will make sense. And if, as you read the book, some of the institutions will make sense as well. Um, first of all, let me tell you that my upbringing was a little bit different. And you're going to see... Um, I, I thought that Skeeter in, in the help was kind of the Forrest Gump of, did you, did you, you know what I mean? It was like, oh, she was there with Maker, Maker Evers when he was killed. Yeah. It was like every time things would happen, she was there. Well, I'm gonna, you're going to say that Ross's were like that too, because that, that kind of happened to me as well. What you need to know is that I, I do have good, solid subject credentials. My mother was born um, on a, yeah, we had to start with your mother, you know. Uh, and by the way, I told Nick I was going to try to do this in this, uh, an entire Southern accent, but it's so exhausting. I, just, <laughs> I, I am going to read you a little, two little snippets in my best Southern. So, 
Yeah, I know, I know. And if I'm tired or drinking, it will <laughs> come out immediately. So, and both. It's really worse when I'm tired or drinking. Yeah. Um, and that's bourbon, by the way, <laughs> because my mother was from Kentucky. She was uh, born on a tobacco farm in Cynthiana, Kentucky, which is about 20, 30 miles north of Lexington. Um, so the family roots, um, the family farm in Kentucky, um, the deed to the farm was signed, um, I'm sorry, yeah, because it was planted, the whole area was planted by George Washington, that George Washington, and the deed to the, the, to the farm was signed by George Washington. The deed was worth more than the farm, okay, you know, exactly. Um, my dad, on the other hand, was from Washington State, and he went to school in Kentucky. That's where my mom and dad met. And then from there, um, they married in, uh, in 1945, and from there, my mom and dad moved to New York City. And my dad was uh, working as a doctorate at Columbia. Uh, my mom was the librarian. My mom was a librarian at the New York Public Library. So um, they, so I come from that kind of a background. My dad was an ordained minister, but never was um, a. Uh, he never had a church. He then, my after he got his doctorate, uh, they moved to Fort Worth, Texas, and my dad was a professor at in Fort Worth for about um, 50 some odd years. The Ralph family sort of stays in one place when we get there. And um, so, uh, so I was born in Fort Worth in 1950. And so if you, it's, it's, it seems to me that, the, that this is all taking place in about 62, 63, 64. So I would have been 12, 13, 14, and old enough to know what the heck was going on, right? So now you kind of know my story. But what I think is important for you guys, for y'all, okay, is uh, that we need to, I need to tell you about the place and what we're talking about. And every place uh, in uh, Mississippi I have been to, and have been to actually recently as well. And um, I have some um, some books on the back of the cookbooks from the Junior League in certain areas. Come on in, if you want. And um, I, I want to talk to you about what these places mean, all right? Uh, this actually is a map from one of the cookbooks. And I know that you can't read what things are, but I want you to see that all of these little little things here refer to plantations, okay? And um, I want you to see that Vicksburg, and here's the Mississippi River, okay? And in Vicksburg, what happens is the Mississippi <coughs> does this little hooky thing right here, okay? And um, in, what you'll notice is that um, being right on the Mississippi River, it was really important in the Civil War. And so what happened was the, um, that Lincoln wanted, he felt like that uh, having Vicksburg surrender would be the key to winning this, the Civil War. And even today, it's often referred to as the key city, and that's the reason. Um, this happens to be, I've been in this, uh, this is the courthouse, which is now the old courthouse, which is now the museum in Vicksburg. And it sits up way up on a hill, so you can see the Mississippi down below. The point being is that Vicksburg, they, they, uh, the, the Confederates were sieged by the, the um, Union Army, and for months and months and months, everything was burned. And so that's why you're not going to see very many um, uh, plantations around them. They just, they simply don't exist anymore. Um, the other place that um, is talked about is Natchez, okay? And I was, I was in Natchez maybe about eight years ago. Um, because there's two times that you go to Natchez for what's called pilgrimage, no kidding. And it is, it's not the pilgrimage, it's just pilgrimage. And it's in the fall and in the spring. And I, I usually spend spring break in the South. Last year I was in Charleston. Um, you know, I have to have my fix. I do it in the spring when there's no humidity. You know, that's my, my goal here. But um, what I want to tell you about Natchez is in the movie, 
they don't have this theme. It's one of the extra themes. If you look at the CD or the DVD, you'll see. Um, Stuart's father, then Stuart was the boyfriend of Skeeter for a while. Um, very, they very, uh, very, you know, just with a little thing they say. And Stuart's father was from, uh, from Natchez. And he was a senator from Natchez. And at that point, Stuart rises up in, in uh, Charlotte's esteem, right? Because she's from, from Natchez. Well, what does that mean, okay? The backstory to Natchez is this. When men were uh, growing up on the East Coast, the firstborn always got the land and the money and all of that. The secondborn son was the one who had to go out and make his fortune. Uh, Winston Churchill was the secondborn son. Right? He went into the politics. So what happened was, is the secondborn sons, all of, many of them, would go to the South to marry rich women. And this is what happened in Natchez. And so Natchez is, um, there's lots of mansions there, okay? And the, the problem that most people don't understand about the South is that there are plantations. And then they're what, what I call party houses, but uh, they're really called townhouses, but you and I call them mansions, all right? If, you, if this is making sense. The plantation is where all the work was done, where the cotton was grown, and all of that. And it, there were too many mosquitoes and it was too hot that nobody actually lived, none of the family lived in, in, the, in, the, in the, on the plantation. They lived in town and this is where they partied and had all, you know, all there to do. Well, as it turns out, during the Civil War, Natchez was spared because all, so many of the second sons were from families from, um, you know, Massachusetts, New York, and places like that. And it w was never burned, and that's why there's so many, you'll notice here, why there are so many still standing beautiful homes in Natchez, because they didn't want to burn their family homes. Mm -hmm. was that, there was that connection. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. And so during pilgrimage, other homes that are not normal, uh, private homes are actually opened up during the so you can see it. So it's, it's, it's a beautiful time. And these are, of course, azaleas. Right? Um, another place that's mentioned is, of course, Jackson, where um, Skeeter's from. Um, it is right off of Pittsburgh, right here, but it's not on the Mississippi River. It's actually on another river. During the Civil War, it was burned three times, and it's named after uh, Andrew Jackson, who was a general who then became a, the a president. And then the capital was moved from Natchez, which is Natchez, to, over to Jackson. Jackson uh, now is about a town of 180,000. It is more of a, a town that is, uh, let me say this, it, it feels more modern to me than, than, um, than Vicksburg and some of the other places. They, they want to get that idea that they're modern. And yet, it was a hotbed, of course, as we know, for the civil rights movement. Um, another place that's mentioned is uh, Biloxi, and Biloxi <coughs> is on the coast. So here's New Orleans, here's Biloxi. I was in Biloxi for the first time in 1972, and uh, it, it was really sad because uh, in 1971, Hurricane Carla had come through, and it just did all the beautiful homes along the, the, the sea front were just, and the big trees were just taken off. Um, and of course, Hurricane Katrina then did even worse damage, exactly. But is sort of interesting, and why, you, when you see that in the book and when it's mentioned as well, um, first of all, it was the, the home of um, Jefferson Davis, the president of the Confederacy, and here's his home, uh, Beauvoir, and I have been to it. It's a beautiful home. Um, I have saw pictures of it after, after Katrina, and I don't know whether they were stored or not. I have no idea. But Biloxi was the place where people went in the summertime, particularly the rich from New Orleans. They would have their summer homes there because you got the breeze from the, from the ocean. So it was a, it's now become sort of a gambling casino mecca, which, yeah, just, yeah. The um, Peace or Air Force Base, when it was there, 
the uh, old country club uh, was the officers club for the, for the base. And then we talk about Ole Miss, right? Oxford, Mississippi, um, where Skeeter goes to school. It is north of this area. Um, I had forgotten that it was actually called the University of Mississippi because no one calls it that. It's always Ole Miss. And um, one of my girlfriends um, uh, that I grew up with, she uh, married a guy who was from Ole Miss. And they were caught in the hurricane in Katrina. They lived in New Orleans. He was a lawyer there. And where they went, this is so crazy, where they went when they fled the city, and she had to leave all the china and the silver and everything, they went to Oxford. I know, it's just like, like moths going back to, you know, the place, yeah. Um, this, up, up until just recently, was the mascot kind of, of Ole Miss. I mean, look at this. Does this just have racial tones like you can't believe, right? Um, in 2002, they became the rebel black bears. I doubt that's going to stick much, you know, but this is, this is uh, Ole Miss Rebel. The other thing you're going to notice in the book is that um, Skeeter would have been in college in Ole Miss when um, it was integrated by James Meredith. And so that's that Forrest Belt thing that I'm talking about. Uh, it was a huge deal. It played out on TV. Kennedy, both John Kennedy and Bobby Kennedy played a part in getting this integrated. Um, but that just having one person attend is I'm not it's not really integration in my mind, right? But it, but it certainly was a uh, a start. So let me talk about segregation and, and what it was like. Um, in the movie, I want you to look because there is a scene in which they are showing the the Jackson Capitol and the Confederate flag is flying over it. Okay. And, and that was, it was still happening when I was uh, in school. Uh, I went to a high school that had 3,000 people in it, and that was huge. And it was just about time to be divided and get a new school. The new school um, was, um, was built at, just as I was graduating, and they were the, they, their symbol was the Confederate flag. I, this was 1968. Still, yeah. So you can see that that was uh, amazing. Um, one of the ways to keep the blacks and other minorities, but primarily the blacks in the, in the South, um, from participating in, in civil society and in government and all, was they used um, these three things, or four things. They would give literacy tests. They, would, uh, they had what's called a grandfather clause. Listen to this. The grandfather clause was, if your grandfather voted, then you could vote. <laughs> yeah. And then in Texas, we used white primaries. And then what I remember was the poll tax. I can remember my parents going to vote. And there's a big sign that said you had to pay your poll tax. And you had to show that you had paid that tax to be able to vote. Of course, these were overturned. But this was the kind of thing that you would get. You would actually get a receipt. And I know it doesn't seem like a whole lot of money, but it, when you think about Skeeter making $8 uh, a, a week, right, for writing your column, and a poll tax is one, two dollars or so, that's a lot of money. Um, when Skeeter first goes to talk um, to the, uh, the maids about their lives, she's read up on Mississippi laws about segregation. And so at that point, she says, um, Skeeter says, Again, uh, against the law, what we're doing. You know? and, and she's absolutely right. Now, some of you may want me to talk about what was it like to be in school, you know, with, um, uh, but I've got to tell you, I, my school was not segregated. Or it was segregated. Um, the Supreme Court ruled uh, get, you know, against segregation, separate but equal, it was not. But Texas decided, and many of the southern states decided, that what they would do is they would do it by kindergartens. It would take 12 years that way to integrate. So, you know, each new kindergarten would be. So I never went to school with any blacks at all in high school. All my K-12 never went to school. 
with me. Um, so that, I mean, it's just, for young people, it just must be unbelievable to think about that. Yeah. So where the blacks? The blacks have their own schools. Yes. Now, this is my theory, okay? Um, I think there were many people, because remember this was Texas, there were many people who were terrified to have um, the black schools play football against other black schools. So the state championship, if you've ever seen Friday Night Lights, they nailed it, okay? The state championship was never between the white schools and the black schools. And so if we suddenly had to integrate the championship playoff, they beat the socks off. And I, I think that was part of it. I really do. Yeah, so they had their absolutely had their own schools. Exactly. Exactly. And when I did my student teaching, um, in, uh, the, the, by the time I did my student teaching, the high school was integrated that I was playing, that I was there. And um, the students were not, the, the school would make out was just not even on par. It was just, it was awful. Um, these kinds of signs were very typical growing up in the South. Um, the, this particular one I wanted to talk to you about, there was a, uh, a, a department store in downtown um, Fort Worth, and it had this, uh, I can remember it just as vividly, I mean, that, that was that sign. And part of the Route family lore is when my brother, who's two years younger, uh, drank from the colored uh, fountain and yells out and announces to everybody, this doesn't taste any different, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and this is a sign you saw in every restaurant, in every restaurant. We preserve the right to serve, um, to refuse service to anyone. I mean, you saw that everywhere. Yeah, you saw it everywhere. Um, the swimming pools, of course were not um, integrated. Uh, they, if, there was a, we had a place called Burgers Lake, and uh, it was a big lake, and, and the, there was a black section and a white section at the, at the scene. This would be 1950s, 60s. So this was very, very typical to see this kind of thing. One of the uh, most poignant scenes, of course, in the movie is, is when, um, Megger uh, Edwards is uh, murdered in Jackson. Um, he was killed on June 12, 1963. He was an activist, civil rights activist, and he was um, with the NAACP. The NAACP stood for the National uh, Association for the Advancement of Colored People. And um, he, they were trying to get, um, of course they were trying, they were for, voting rights, but they also tried to get lunch counters integrated, buses integrated, uh, just any kind of thing that they could get integrated. So this is a, a kind of a, a group picture of the NAACP. This is a picture of Megger uh, Evers. This was a famous picture that appeared where that's his wife who is uh, kissing him. This actually is a clip from the movie itself. And um, notice that they're looking at the famous Life magazine. Uh, cover. I do want to mention the gloves here. We're going to come to gloves in a minute, okay? So there's little things I want you to see about that. And I want you to also see that she has on her pearls, which I wore today for you guys. And we'll talk about pearls too, okay? Um, in the help, uh, what happens is the bus driver says, color people off the bus. Uh, some neighbor got shot, right? And and, it, and, and how terrifying that must have been at the time. Which brings me to what do you call, what do we call blacks, right? And, and I, I've got to tell you that my generation found the word colored absolutely abhorrent. It just made us crazy, okay? That would have been my mother's generation and further back. Um, I, of course, never heard anybody use the N word. I mean, that just, you know, that was just not something people said. It was just not. But you didn't use black yet. We had, that hadn't come into the, the vocabulary. So. 
And even I think you can see the NAACP has named itself colored people. And they have not changed that because they're such an iconic group that how would you change that name? So, what was it like having me, right? Um, this scene from the, the movie uh, in which um, Hilly, she, she does this, you know, she says, uh, she, uh, Skeeter's saying, Constantine quit us, right? And she just clenches herself, doesn't she? Right? And it's like the worst thing that could happen, right? It was like, oh my God. And when anything, when you're about to say something bad about somebody, you always say, bless her heart, you know, that you, you always get that. That somehow takes the sting out of all of that, right? Um, but when a maid worked for you, that person is, is later on, uh, Skeeter said that she worked for for 29 years. You, you, that was part of the family. That person became part of the family. Now, I grew up with two two and one of them was Florida that was mine and the other and the next door neighbors uh, was Carrie now Carrie is would be more the traditional one that you guys have seen in the let's talk about in the, in the hell uh, Florida did not come every day unlike Carrie who came every day my next door neighbor was a a doctor Dr. Bath he was a OBGYN and his wife's name was Dilly. Okay. I can't believe that was really her name. I don't know what it really was. But two things happen in the South with names. Um, you either get a nickname, like Skeeter, or you get a double name. It's like my mother's name was Ruth Elwood. There's nobody in the family named Elwood. This just comes out of fabric. I don't know. Her mother was Rosa Dell, her, whose sister was Lena Russell who had a sister named Effie Thomas. I mean, they all, you know. And my best friend growing up was Mary Mac. Okay, it's almost two names like that. Um, and notice that the baby is May Mobley, right? In, in the help, the little baby, the little toddler's May Mobley. So either got a nickname or, or, now me, my mother was an English major, and so what I got was Shakespeare, the Shakespeare character, yeah, so, yeah. Um, I don't know. I just never fit in, did I, there? Um, what I remember about um, uh, Carrie was that she would come in the morning and she would leave, you know, 5 o'clock or whatever, which allowed Dilly, who I never called Dilly, she was always Mrs. Bowden, okay, um, allowed her to do what Dilly did, which I'm not sure what that was. Um, she played tennis a lot. She went to lunch. Her hair was always perfect. Um, and she didn't have to take care of the kids. And every house that I grew up in, when, when, you know, when you go to see, visit friends, everybody had a maid who was there all the time. So the, the mothers then, that freed them up. See, the mothers didn't work then. And that my mother didn't learn to drive until she was 40. Okay, so the people just lunched and did stuff like that. There was, um, and you had to have someone who was there all the time to take care of stuff, right? And that's the way it was. Now, my family, on the other hand, um, we were the kind that cleaned up for the maid before the maid came. You know, that was that was us. Yeah. So we're going to talk a little bit more about Florida. What I really remember um, is that there was um, a couple blocks away, maybe four or five blocks away from my house and the Bowden's house. You kind of went down the hill, and that's where the bus route was. And busing was very important because you needed to get the maids from their side of town to the white side of town. So this is this was even in small towns, you would have to have a bus system. Okay. So what I remember is that that there was this um, parking lot that had been built. There was no reason to have a parking lot. It was a bus stop. But it's only when, I, I'm going to tell you, there were so many things as I'm doing this presentation for you that I had to think about and say, why was this? Because you needed to have a place for the women to park their cars 
so they can pick up their maids. What, have you ever seen a parking lot at a bus stop? And most, no, no, but you needed, they waited for the bus to come to pick up their maids to bring them home, bring them to their house, right? Um, and there's lots of busing scenes, if you noticed it. Uh, it is this true the book as well, I'm sure? Yeah, lots of busing scenes. And um, very, very typical, I mean, I rode on buses where the blacks were in the back and the whites were in the front. Now we're going to talk about the influence of the black churches and how important this was in, in society. Um, there was, um, I know you've heard of Martin Luther King Jr. He founded the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And um, they believed that, as I put here, that the churches should become involved in social issues. The idea of social justice was very important. This was very controversial because there are other uh, clergy who believed that you, you really should serve the to serve the, the spiritual needs of people, not, not the social needs of people. And um, as it turned out, in this, in this was, he started this in 1957, it turns out that my dad and mother and about two other couples had dinner with Martin Luther King in 1959. Because what Martin Luther King did was he began to go to the clergy, to the ministers, to the white and black churches, to, to bring this social justice together. And here is the kicker to this story. I did not know about this until about five years ago. <coughs> I did not know my parents knew Martin Luther King. It was not until the Fort Worth Star Telegram did a story about my dad and my mother having this th having this meeting, this dinner with my dad with Martin Luther King. And the kicker to that story is, it was done by a columnist at the Fort Worth Star Telegram who had been one of my students when I was just a, a student teacher. How did my parents not tell me this? How did this happen? You know. And so, of course, now I'm quizzing my dad. It was like, but it was a mystical, magical experience, as you can imagine. From then on, we began to get mail from the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And I, I had this vision, I had this memory of six standing in the kitchen, getting the mail and looking through it, and seeing the S, you know, Southern Christian Leadership mail, and thinking, boy, I wonder what our mailman, think. it was a mailman too, by the way. I wonder what our mailman was thinking about this. I mean, you know, this was pretty radical for, for this time. And uh, pretty amazing. Well. When women went to church, uh, white or black, they dressed in the nuns. And notice, I call it BYOF, you had to bring your own fan. Because there was no air conditioning in those churches. And it was hot as heck, let me tell you. And I remember one of the things, that, as you were beginning to become a woman, you know, a young girl, that you were given a fan that you could take. You know, you had all kinds of pretty fans that you would have. Um, well, of course, Florida realized that soon that my dad was a minister. And so one day she got up the courage to ask my dad if he would preach at her black church. And these church services lasted literally all day. They were, it was an all-day affair when you went. My dad said it, was, it really took him back because they did the whole amen and amen and over and yes, but, you know, that thing. And he... But he said, what he said, what he, afterwards he said, you really get into it. You know, I mean, you just, you just get swept up with that whole thing. It's just, you know, absolutely amazing. So, um, I will tell you, and, and one of the things that Dad said to me was that Florida's esteem in her church just rose. When she was being able, to, when she brought in the preacher, you know, that was, she, yeah, she was hot stuff there. I do want to tell you one little story about Florida. Um, one day we found her looking at, um, Life Magazine put, had put a book together or something after one of the space uh, flights, you know. And she was just studying it and looking at it. And we, we had said, what's going on, you know. And Florida, 
I remember, I can just remember, we were in the, she, we, we found her looking at, and she came into the kitchen, we were eating breakfast, and she said, is that moon up there, is that the same one that, you know, is this, are they really doing this? Because I'm hearing in the black community, you know, that this is, it's all been faked, that it's not real. And she was just fascinated with this Life magazine book that had pictures of space shots. Gotta talk about the junior Lee. God, if I had stayed in Texas, I too, I know, would have been in the junior league. God forbid. Yeah. Well, let me tell you about junior leagues. Okay. Junior league, and I, they, they were formed in 1901. I'm going to read this to you because I think it's the irony is just way too much. The Junior League for the Promotion of the Settlement Movement was founded in 1901 in New York City. Here's the quote. The settlement movement was a reformist social movement beginning in the, 19, uh, the 1880s and peaking around the 1920s in England and the U.S. With the goal of getting the rich and the poor in society to live more closely together in an interdependent community. <laughs> right. Well, we... To me, Junior League was just an extension of sororities from college. And we had what were called charity clubs in high school. So you just went from this charity club thing to a sorority in college to Junior League. It just, it just was this continuum of stuff that happened like that. And um, they all, you know, she's, Hilly's always trying to get things what is for the poor and all of that, but it was really never about that, not really. Um, the charity clubs that I, uh, the charity club that I belonged to, and by the way, we even had, well, I can't remember the name, I think it was called Presentation, but you went to the country club and you were presented and you had to learn how to bow. I know. And I was going to try to find those pictures, but I thought there's something left in the basement, you know, that I, I you know, maybe sometimes I'll have the courage to bring those in, but, you know, long gloves, yeah, the whole bit, yeah. We had to pick a song, the whole bit. Um, mine was a Frank Sinatra song, just to tell you that. And um, the, the charity, these charity clubs were actually outlawed about a year or two after I graduated, because by that point, integration had happened, right? So. They, the Texas Supreme Court uh, outlawed them. The, um, so poor uh, Skeeter, she, the, 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 we know how bad the world is for her when she says she's not going to New York and Skeeter is told she has nothing left but the enemies in the Junior League. I mean, she has no one, really, at that point in the Junior League. I gotta talk about the DAR. The DAR is the older version of the Junior League, all right? Um, and uh, this is off of their website um, from today. I got this on Sunday at night. The DAR, founded in 1890 and with headquarters in Washington, D.C., is a nonprofit, nonpolitical, volunteer women's service organization dedicated to promoting patriotism, preserving American history, and securing uh, America's future through better education for children. Okay? Any woman, 18 years or older, regardless of race, religion, or ethnic background, who can, here's the picture, who can prove lineage descent from a patriot of the American <coughs> Revolution is eligible for membership. I could have been a member. Yeah, we, we the family, you know, they went to Boston, did the genealogy. Yeah, this is one of those things. When I came to Wyoming, didn't tell anybody that I was eligible for the DAR. You know, you just, but remember, this is one of the critical uh, turning points in the story because Charlotte is embarrassed by her maid and her daughter, uh, the maid's daughter, um, in front of the president of the DAR, and she has to save face. This is how, uh, this would be the older woman's version of the Junior League and how powerful and strong that would be. I don't tell you about there is a line that Charlotte says in the, in the movie, and I love, now I, I really want to read the book, you know, as I see on this. Skeeter's mother, Charlotte, was third runner-up, okay, as if this is really important, Th not, not second, first, third runner-up in the South Carolina beauty pageant, okay, South Carolina. Um, 
Beauty pageants were a big deal, and of course, the Miss America was the biggest deal of all, right? But um, I was, it, I went to TCU, and when I was at TCU, uh, Phyllis George became <laughs> Miss America. She had been Miss Texas. She went to TCU. So that meant one of my sorority sisters, who was first runner-up, became Miss Texas, okay? And we touted that everywhere, you know. I mean, we had Miss Wool. I mean, who, who cares, right? But we had this, yeah. Um, when I first came to Wyoming, my very first student um, uh, in, in Wingspan, she said to me one day she, she wanted to try out the Miss, Miss Wyoming pageant. And I was just like horrified, you know. And I said, oh, God, you don't want to do that. But she wanted the scholarship money and, you know, and so I said, okay. Well, if you're going to do this, we're going to do it right, you know. And so I just, I said, I've never been a believer, but I've been around here, and I know how this works. And, you know, so. Bridge clubs and parties, they, that was, they were everywhere. That was what you did. Um, I am terrified because I can't play bridge. And I am terrified of growing old and going to a, a senior home and because I watched all of my family members who knew how to play bridge, and they were always popular when they went to the nursing home <laughs> because they could play bridge, and I can't, and I'm just terrified about getting all of them, you know? I know, I know, I'm so, I'm so scared about this. But, but this was, you know, you had lunches, you had, um, when I graduated from high school, that, that spring, we had, you had a luncheon every week or something that was given to you for graduating. Um, and, it, and it was payback for other social obligations, you know? I, I never really quite understood all that, but we had all those kinds of parties. And um, so, very, very big. Got to come back country club, right? One of the famous things, of course, is in the country club with What's the gal's name that's uh, the flusy person? The, I can't remember her name. You know, the one who's married to Johnny? <sighs> can't remember. Anyway, you know, she makes a, a, a spectacle of herself, right? And here's from the, this is from the, um, the actual movie where the maids are lined up. This is exactly, exactly the way it would be. This is a picture of the Johnson Country, uh, Jackson Country Club. And this I got off their website on Sunday. Ready for this? The mission of the Country Club of Jackson is to provide the finest social environment, food, and recreational facilities possible for those individuals who share a common interest. Membership into the club is by invitation only, without regard to sex, race, religious affiliation, or national origin. You know, you know, it's, it's back to that. As long as you can prove uh, that the lineage to a patriot, you know, then you're okay. Yeah, we belong to. Now, Dilly and her husband belonged to Rivercrest. That was the old money country club. A lot of my friends belonged to Colonial Country Club. The, you, some of you want to watch golf. Colonial Country Club is where they have the golf tournament here. That was more new money. Uh, my parents belonged to the Liberal Country Club. Okay? Can you guess why? We, our country club allowed, uh, guess who they allowed? That made them liberal. You guess? Women. Huh? Women? No, because you always join this. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 Jews. Oh, yeah. 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 That made us liberal. Yeah. Um, my brother told me a story uh, the other day, because I've been talking to families, and my, and my recollections about this right. He told me a story that I don't recall, so I do not believe I was there, because I think it would have been one of those searing moments. But apparently, <coughs> after being at the country club one day, my dad took the family in the car and went up to this bluff that overlooked the, the country club that kind of went down to the river, you know. And uh, there was a, a brick wall, a literal brick wall, between Como, which was the black community, and uh, the country club on the other side. And my dad said, we're going to tear this wall down, okay? And and you might say, well, why were why were your parents a member of the of the, of the uh, you know of the country club? It was golf. That was all that really in amount to, you know. And you play golf, you know. You just you want a good golf course, right? 
Um, college and marriage. So this I'm going to, what was it like to live in the South and be in the South? Couple things, some lines from the movie. That women majored in professional hu uh, husband hunting, true. Uh, Skeeter has no man and no babies, right? Uh, the, the job is the last stop until marriage and not married, being married was equal to uh, lesbians. Um, all true, all true. And you know, I, I, I found that sad. I, I found it happening still in the late 60s and the early 70s, that that was the reason that people were going um, to getting married. So that I thought those were right on with them. Um, I, of course, I felt an affinity to Skeeter because I was in journalism. This is something I'm not sure is, could be true about, because I think when I was editor of my campus daily at TCU, I was the first woman who ever was an editor of a paper. When I, when I worked at a daily newspaper, I was the youngest, I was the only woman and the youngest person in the United States running a daily newspaper. So to have Skeeter be editor of her paper at Ole Miss, I don't know. I just don't know. That was a little liberal license there. I don't know. But she wants to be a journalist or a novelist or both, right? Um, and notice, though, that she gets hired for $8 an hour to write a cleaning column, right? Which would have been true. And I know that I, even though I was a news editor at a paper, that I was not allowed to cover the police beat this was early 70s, and I, when, when I asked why I couldn't cover the police beat, I was told I might have to cover a story about bestiality. <laughs> really? <laughs> really? <laughs> that comes up so much, you know? <laughs> I know, I know. It was just like, really, you know? Um, and then, I, I, these are all true stories. And Stuart, of course, says to her, um, never met a woman who said that she said what she was thinking. And women just weren't told to do that. You know, they were not, not allowed. And I did have to mention the whiteout, right? For the, yeah. Well, let's talk about dresses and clothes and things like that. Um, when you watch the movie, look at the pearls. There are pearls everywhere, okay? I went to my safety deposit box and got the good pearls out today. Because you have two sets of pearls. Yeah, well, you have several sets of pearls. You have the pearls that you, you know, like you wear out to the country club, okay? But then you have the pearls that you wear every day. I mean, literally every day. And notice how many times Charlotte's in the kitchen and she has pearls on, right? Because you do have the good pearls and the other everyday pearls, and then you inherit pearls, you know. You just got pearls everywhere, yeah. Um, and so here are pearls here, uh, pearls here when she's doing the hair, right? Pearls here on the mother. By the way, Sissy Spacek is from Quana, Texas. I want you to know she's my age. Um, there was a lot of large earrings going on, you know, big big earrings. If you go to a, a, a like a flea market or a place like that, you see a lot of the fifties and sixties jewelry be like that. At one point, um, uh, Charlotte has on a sweater guard. I tried to find one. I, I couldn't find it. I, I'm guessing I got rid of it, you know. Um, and hats, everywhere hats. Um, and particularly at this point in time, the smaller hat on top of the head. Um, the, you know, the Jackie O pillbox thing was, was going to be in. And uh, you wore hats uh, all the time, everywhere. Um, I'm going to talk about mink coat, mink stole. You wouldn't have a mink coat in the south. It's would just be too hot, right? But you had to have a mink stole. This, I couldn't, this would be the kind that I have. Now, I'm going to tell you a story, and I had never thought about this until Sunday night. When my mother died 16 years ago, she died rather suddenly. It was during the final exams um, at, at, at LCC. And we went down, uh, it was in December, went down. And within a few days after being, being there, my dad said, we have to go to the, to the um, cold storage place. I said, okay. And I knew exactly why. We had to go get mother's mink stall. Because now it was my mink stall. 
right? Which it inherited, inherited. You know, you know what I'm saying with this? Yeah. Well, I had never in 16 years worn that new skull. I do remember that the theater department here at El Trimble City borrowed it for a play. This is probably like a $10,000 stole, you know what I mean? But sure, fine, take it for the play, I don't care. Um, and um, the odd part about this is it never occurred to me that this was odd. I'm the oldest daughter, I get the stole, right? This is the way things happen. Is that crazy? Yeah. Well, I did tell you, I must tell you that Friday or Saturday night or Sunday night, I had to go searching for the stole. I frankly did not know where it was. And it is okay. So I, yeah. yeah. The dead apple is okay. And the dresses and the gloves. I got to talk about the gloves. Um, uh, this actually, I, I found on the internet, this was the sketches for the dress that um, was supposed to be uh, done by Skeeter. But notice that there are different kinds of gloves for different occasions. This would be your wedding gloves, your presentation gloves, your debutante gloves, you know, they go over the elbow. Then you have the kind that go up to the elbow, so that would be more evening. And then um, these kind of just regular everyday gloves, right? Um, they, they also had a, a, a glove that went up to about here, okay? To that, about that size, okay? Um, you just didn't go anywhere without your gloves. And usually, you know, I don't recall us wearing a lot of colored gloves. They were almost always white. But I want you to, there's a scene that I want you to, to, when you're looking at the movie, that I want you to look at. And in this scene, the, the mother over here, is, she's reading the book, The Help, in the um, nursing home. Remember that part? And I want you to look at her gloves that she's wearing. Because she's wearing a different kind of glove that you wore outside, which was not a gardening glove. The glove was to keep your hands from being tanned. You wore it a little bit thinner. And because if you had tan gloves or tan hands, that meant that you were working and not, you know what I'm saying? It, it, that you, yeah, it, you weren't of a higher status. So that was really important. In here. Um, uh, I, uh, I never had the problem that. Um, that Skeeter had. I did not have curly hair. I had completely straight hair. But yes, we did the big things like that. We did the, the orange juice cans. Um, you know, we did that as well. Um, and hair was a big deal. And you had permanence at home and all of that kind of thing. I, I love this scene. And I wanted to show you too because this would be so typical uh, in a household where the, the maid would be there and doing things, but you would be doing other things. And it was just all part of one kind of big happy family. By the way, this is a colored Hoosier cabinet. I have one of those from Kentucky. So. And this, of course, is Hilly. Um, they got this completely wrong because you would never wear a brown purse with that dress. I mean, what were they thinking? As we used to say, it was you wore a Neiman Marcus dress with a matching shoes and purse. You know, that's what you did. And her purse would have been probably white, maybe pink, but it would have never been brown. Never. Yeah. And notice the bows in the hair. And notice the earrings as well. Those were the drop earrings, the pearl earrings. And food. What can we say about food? Um, Minnie says um, um, fried chicken makes you feel better about life, and then you don't burn chicken, right? Um, what we're talking about here is that fried chicken takes time, and it's slow, and it's not fast food, and it's, you know, it, it is something you do, that it is feel good kind of, uh, of food. Um, Johnny says that he knew Minnie was the cook, remember he said, he says, uh, uh, I knew right away, fried chicken and okra at the same time, you know. <laughs> And I must tell you, I have to have my fix. I go down to Fort Collins and I go to, um, what's the place now? Oh, first the, uh, yeah, no, the, you know, the, uh, the Southern Cooking Place. I can't remember the name. Oh, of Black Eyed Pea. And I always get fried okra and black, uh, get red beans and rice, you know. So those were the kinds of things we had at school all the time. And every woman in the South knew how to make 
a chicken salad, deviled eggs, and iced tea. Um, my husband used to say that I had the best chicken salad ever, and you do, you learn how to do that. You know, you just you know how to do that. Uh, deviled eggs. My church insists that I bring deviled eggs. You know, you know how to do that. I get no recipe. You just sort of know. And iced tea. You want to know the quick secret how how to make the best iced tea? Um, is that you only you boil the water. You have about two cups of boiled water. You put the tea in that. Put the sugar, some sugar, in it while it's hot. Then you add water, and you have to go out to the garden and get mint as well. Okay. And you would, I, you know, pepper. You have to have pep, pepper. And cokes. You know, there's several scenes in there with Coca-Cola. In the South, all cokes, all, all soft drinks are a coke. You know, and that's Coke with a little C, because we know that it's a trademark. We know. <laughs> now, uh, I got this from a book, of, of, of a recipe book that I have in the back here, and this is uh, from Mississippi. This is, uh, and I want you to do you see something there? I was in shock when I found this on Sunday. The pot, <laughs> exactly like many made, isn't it? Exactly like that. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Go back to what you referred to. No, no, no. No. Okay. So. Oh, coke. Sorry. Call yeah. It what? You always call it the coke. Yeah, but what kind of drink was it? A soft drink. Any soft drink. Uh, what you call it a soda? It's either a soda or a soft drink. Yeah. You didn't call it pop. No, we did not call it pop. It was always coke. Pop was morning. And yes, absolutely. Yeah, everything's a Coke. Well, yeah. Sandy, I've ordered an orange Coke in the South, yeah. um, which is like orange soda. But I've yeah. 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 yeah, pop too. Yeah, yeah. 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 I know. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, let me see what my time's up next. I'm going to read you in Southern. Okay, I'm going to read this. Okay, you ready? <laughs> I'm to get to my mind. Here. Mother had one of those wonderful cooks named Estherine for about 40 years. Those were the days when all the ladies had their bridge clubs at home about 20 or 30 years ago. Estherine did a beautiful scalloped oyster dish similar to oysters Johnny Rabb in vintage Vicksburg, but she had no recipe. Everything was just pinches and dashes and whatever. All the ladies wanted a recipe. So one day, they must have caught her in a good mood because she gave them the recipe. She put a little bit of this, a little bit of that, the whole, the whole smear. They went merrily on their way thinking about how much, how, how much they had accomplished that day. About a week or two later, Estherine was in the Piggly Wiggly doing uh, mother's marketing. And one of those ladies was in the line with her. The lady said, Estherine, honey, I did those scalloped oysters just like you told us to. But you know, they didn't taste like yours. And Esther he drew herself up and said, I didn't tell them to. <laughs> I know, I can drop into this. Okay, ready? Right? It's about parties. A lot of people have given, given memorable parties, and a lot of people have attended memorable parties. But you can bet that when one particular party of mine is mentioned, all others seem just a bit trivial. With several of the people, I was having a 25th anniversary party for German and Judy Jordan. Naturally, I had worked all day long side by side with my longtime housekeeper, Fanny. All the other hosts and hostesses started arriving about 30, 30 minutes before the party hour. As I hustled and bustled on the final touches, I told Fanny to go put her feet up in the den. When the first guest rang the doorbell, I stuck my head around the, to tell Fanny to come out. But there's no one to express the flood of emotion I felt in response to what I saw. Fanny was dead. <laughs> she had just sat down, propped her feet up, and died. There are a lot of different renditions of what happened next, but honestly, I don't remember what took place except mass confusion. <laughs> Absolutely no one knew what to do. <laughs> Guests were at the door. Fanny was dead. <laughs> and you know, Emily Post just doesn't, she just, 
She just doesn't address this thing. <laughs> well, we made it through the evening, and I will miss Fanny until my dying day. But you can be assured of one thing. No Vicksburgers giving a party with me have ever popped up their feet like that. <laughs> okay? I'm almost done here. Um, one of the things I want you to watch is silver. There is silver everywhere, okay? And when I was in the sorority, um, we, when, we, when people would get honors, they got silver. They, you got silver plates, silver bowls, silver whatever, okay? Um, when I came to Wyoming, I had, I came with all my silver and, you know, a full set of china for 12 and I was living in the basement apartment, you know, and making $100 a week, so. But this would look like, my, this is why the, what Christmas would look like at my house. So, I mean, any meal, you know, big meal, this is, you put everything on the silver. <laughs> and notice when Adeline has Skeeter at her house that that she's serving her on the best china that she has, right? And she's just doing desserts and, and the whole thing. And she says, never had a white person in my house, right? Well, you would just do this up all the time. And even living alone now, since my husband has died, I still have flowers on the table, and I still, my dining room table still has, yeah, I know, I can't help it. There's stuff, you just, yeah. But, um, do you remember that part where she says, uh, tomorrow is silver polishing day? Well, it does. It takes a lot of that to do all that polishing. Okay. So, in conclusion, I guess, is um, what's it like to grow up Southern and now live in Wyoming? I have now been in Wyoming twice as long as I lived in this house. Um, do I have a maid? <laughs> Holly and I have been together <laughs> for 28 years. And um, we have been through um, sickness and health, uh, through her back breast cancer. We have um, been through the death of my husband, in which she just insisted we could, I could, take, we could take care of him at home when he was dying. And I said, Holly, we've got to go to hospice. We can't do this ourselves. But that's what she was willing to do. Okay. And, you know, everything in between when you've been together for, for 28 years. Right? Um, and I'm, I'm not making this up. Last week, she said to me, she said, she, I, 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 I just, when she said this to me, I stopped in my tracks. Because what happened was, I didn't have Christmas at my house this year, and so um, things were just sort of out of whack, out of whatever gets around. And this is what she said to me. She told me that next week is silver publishing day. I am not, I just looked at her and I said, of course it is. Because she has run up of the house, she knows the schedule, and we got off. It should have been done in December right before Christmas, and it didn't get done, right? Thank you, guys. I have some more things I was going to show you. Um, I do have a class at one, but I'm going to just show them to you. I won't talk because I went. These are, you know how in the film, and when you get a DVD, there's extras? These are my extras. Okay. <laughs> um, I want you to look at the phones in the movie. Okay. Um, you, never, you didn't have a portable phone, and you, if you had a, a as a teenager, you always stretch the cord somewhere. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, and the editor noticed that the editor has a princess file, which was my silver. Right. Uh, oh, wait. One more thing. Uh, in the movie, uh, her number is Emerson six eight four. Mine was Walnut four three three seven. Okay. Um, uh, the TV. Uh, we had portable TVs. They weighed like two hundred pounds. We put a handle on it. They call that portable. Okay. And then there was the invention of the metal, the metal TV tray, okay? And of course she was writing, uh, watching uh, Five Nights. Um, Cadillac, remember this was, this t told you that she was from a wealthy family. I have two cars, one of them is a Cadillac. And um, the other thing I would just want to end with is, um, you also had a gardener. And there are, is a scene in when uh, she comes, 
she's coming back up the hat. Isn't she carrying her dress for the evening or something? But if you look in the background, there is a, the black gardeners are in the in the gardens now. So that would be a whole other scene, wouldn't it, to do to do that as well. So I don't. I am the gardener now. So yeah, yeah. So yeah, I don't get it. Everybody says, Oh, you should get somebody to, to mow your lawn and all. And I go, hell, oh, that's the easiest thing to do. You know, it's the weeding and the cutting and the yeah, that's the thing. So anyway, I hope that you enjoyed that and that, that um, it, it'll put it in perspective for you when you read the book or watch the video.